Welcome. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. And this morning, we have invited uh, Patrick Halliday in from the Agency of Education to give us an update uh, and a little background on the annual snapshot. So welcome um, back, Patrick Halliday. appreciate your joining us today. Thank you. My pleasure. For the record, Patrick Halliday, I'm the director of the Education Quality Division at the, the Agency of Education. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, oh, um, there we go. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. I have the right thing here. Um, and I, as always, please interrupt me if there are any questions. I didn't want to take up too much of your time and go too deep into the snapshot itself before uh, twenty. This this most recent. Um, uh, before this more, most recent release, but I'm, I'm happy to go back and, and fill in uh, kind of any gaps in understandings um, and, um, and, and give any information that folks have. Um, you, could, you could just start with explaining where this comes from. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So the annual snapshot, um, and as we talked a couple of weeks ago about the education quality standards, the annual snapshot really comes out of a way of looking at the education quality standards and then figuring out a way to <clears throat> understand how well uh, schools or LEAs, uh, how successful they're being in addressing those education quality standards in meeting the goals laid out there. And at the state level, <clears throat> excuse me, at the state level, we have two different ways to help schools with that. Uh, one is the annual snapshot, and the annual snapshot is um, a series of, of indicators that are organized um, under the, um, the, the domains that you see there of academic proficiency, personalization, safe, healthy schools. They're the same questions for all schools. Not all schools can necessarily answer those questions. For example, one of the academic proficiency indicators is graduation rate. If I'm at a K through six school, I'm not going to have a graduation rate. For, you know, just, just as an example. So not everything is applicable in every, in every state case. Um, and the information is reported out by the individual school. It's reported out by the, the SU or SD, and then it's also reported out at the state level. And it's the exact same indicators, again, at all three of those levels. The organization of the snapshot is the, the same for each of those. Um, I think I mentioned under the uh, each one of these five domains that you're seeing here, proficiency, personalization, safe, healthy schools, et cetera, there are a handful of indicators that are used. And really this in conjunction with the integrated field reviews are the two ways that the state has to help schools get information on uh, how they're doing in meeting their education quality standards. And this is all in service, not uh, in service of driving uh, continuous improvement plans. So the schools, um, can get information from that snapshot, get information from the integrated field reviews, and then really under, uh, better understand what their specific needs might be so that they can uh, address those needs. And it's also, I think the other thing to add is there was really uh, de uh, designed um, with a really strong eye to, to equity. So schools are able to look at, um, and schools, LEAs, the state, are able to look at specific student groups. Uh, we look at all students, but we can also look at specific student groups to be able to identify where those achievement gaps or those equity gaps uh, are pervasive. And you can't address the gaps unless you actually know they're there. So I'm going to move forward here. Um, and for every for this, we're looking at a state a state level screenshot from the the annual snapshot right here. Um, and this is from data from the 1819 uh, school year. Um, and you can see under each one. You mean of the, that 1918 as opposed to 1819, right? Uh, this is this is uh, this is uh, from the 20. I'm looking right now from the the, the previous year. This is from the 2018-2019 snapshot, and we'll look at in just a second. We'll look at 2019-2020, just because I want to show the difference in what we have, uh, what a, a typical year looks like, and then what we have from the the information that was just released. And you can see in the, the 1819 snapshot under each one of these uh, domains, there is a, a rating. And then we can also see how, um, I'm not sure if you can see that, how, how that um, uh, holds, uh, sorry. Um, and we can see how that rating has changed uh, um, compared to the previous year. Um, and then under each one of those, uh, and I'll show this in just a second, under each one of those, uh, 
domains, we can look drill down further to, to get to get more nuanced information. But last week, um, I think uh, a week ago Monday, we released data from the 1920 school year that was uh, obviously substantially affected by uh, the COVID shutdown. And so instead of looking like this, the state level snapshot uh, for the data that was just released has a bunch of NAs on it because uh, many of the indicators that were used uh, to populate these domains do weren't collected. Um, and so to go a little bit further on this, uh, and, and since they weren't collected, there was no way really to report them out. Um, to go a little further on this, um, if you were to drill down, if you're just to click um, on the actual website itself under this academic proficiency uh, right here, if you were to click on that, you would go to a page that looks like this. Now, again, this is from the 1819 as opposed to the one that was just released last week. And not focusing so much on the outcome of the data, but just the, the, the presentation of it, you can see for this is uh, based on the, uh, the SBAC for English Language Arts, the SBAC for Math, the Vermont Science uh, Assessment, the Vermont Physical Education Assessment. There's information um, both on current performance, how that performance is compared to last year, and uh, what sort of gaps that we're seeing um, from, from year to year. We have and, a question. Have yeah, a question. I'm sorry. Yes, please. please. Representative Austin. Yeah, just to understand um, how to look at this, the equity index, yep. uh, I'm assuming that means equity of opportunity. That's what that's looking at. And I'm just wondering, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, no, go ahead, go ahead. I'm just wondering how it's measured, the equity yeah. index. Great question. So the equity index, so what we're looking at right here is information um, for the entire state. So these are all students in the state. Um, and we're looking, uh, so the equity index in this particular case, um, what you see kind of under these two, um, uh, reflects um, how the historically, mar how big is the gap be uh, in performance between on, on the English language arts SBAC, how big is the gap in performance in 18, the 1819 school year between historically marginalized population students and their historically privileged peers. And what this is simply showing is there's a fairly large gap between those. And historically marginalized has uh, several different um, uh, you know, uh, student groups included into that. It's any student who is from uh, a racial or ethnic minority, is eligible for free and reduced lunch, is, on an, um, uh, is eligible for special education services, uh, or is an English learner. So anyone who fits in any four of those categories, this is kind of an accumulation of those four categories. Um, you, we could choose, say, free and reduced lunch. And um, I, I don't have that up here. Um, I, I'd be happy to show it to you. I could choose free and reduced lunch. And in that case, the equity index would show just specifically students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch, how big is the performance gap um, between those students who are not eligible for free and reduced lunch. And this change over here represents uh, how does this um, gap, uh, how big is that this gap compared to uh, the previous year? So in this case, how big is this gap compared to the 17, 18 school year? And what it shows is there's a gap. It's about the same gap as it was uh, uh, the year before, or the, yeah, the gap in, in 1819 is similar to the gap that we see in uh, 1718. So just I, I thought I saw another hand. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Does this align with the dashboard, the AOE dashboard data? Uh, yes, uh, I am not an expert on the dashboard though. So I, 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 I don't spend as much time looking at the dashboard, uh, but it's populated from, from, from the same collections. Okay, great, thank you. Representative James? Thanks. Um, this is so interesting. So I, I was going to ask if it was what groups it was disaggregated by, but you answered that question. So n now I want to ask um, on the equity index, any gap. I, I mean, I assume that the standard is there should be no gap. And so anything less than a gap, any kind of gap means you're not meeting. Uh, it gets complicated and, and it, that is the intent of it. The way that it actually shows up, however, is a little bit different. So if we were looking at, uh, you can select just to look at historically, the historically privileged students, right? Those students who are not in one of those four categories that I mentioned. And at that point, 
um, what we'd see is a gap that uh, we would see kind of a positive gap that would show up as not meeting, but it would show up as exceeding because that group of students doesn't have a gap compared to the, uh, are outperforming their comparison group. Um, so that's not necessarily the the intent of looking at the equity gap, but if you do start poking around, you can get some things that appear counterintuitive uh, to that. But um, but the default settings on it are to look at you know in this case historically marginalized compared to uh, is uh, is the comparison group that we uh, that it defaults to. But I can select on this all sorts of different groups. So if I were to select uh, students who are not on an IEP, for example, who are not eligible for special education services. Um, most likely I'm going to see um, kind of a positive gap, if you will, because the students who are not on an IEP are outperforming those students who are on an IEP. And is this data that we can actually select and see? Absolutely. Yeah, this is all information that's uh, that's available on the website. Um, and um, and I, yeah, and if, if you want, I'm, I'd be happy to, to navigate over here. I didn't want to spend too much time uh, talking about the uh, kind of the mechanics of the snapshot. If uh, if that's not what the board was or the uh, uh, the, the committee was interested in, in hearing. Um, but I'm happy to go into that in more detail to, to give more of a, a tour if, uh, if if you'd be interested in that. Well, I don't want. I do have more questions, but I don't want to bog us down. So, uh, you know, I can come come back later or reach out to you to understand more. Sure. Let's see. Maybe if there's time, we could we could go do a tour. But I yeah, think I'm happy to do so. Here. Yeah. What I really what I really wanted to show here is, you know, this is data from the eighteen nineteen school year, and then you'll see a stark change when we look at the nineteen twenty school year because we have no data. Um, none of these assessments were there. So um, this is one of the tools that we're giving to schools to try to say, um, uh, you know, to, to identify what their specific needs are. But none of these assessments, uh, the English language uh, SBAC, the math SBAC, the science, uh, the Vermont science assessment, the Vermont physical education assessment, none of those assessments took place. So there's no data that schools can be using to, uh, you know, to, to get that. There's, and there's nothing we can do about it because the assessments didn't occur during, um, during COVID. Um, and the full uh, indicators, um, and let me just use some uh, English language, arts, math, science, physical education, just understanding our language. Those are indicators in there are in total um, uh, 18, I think, different indicators that show up. Um, but these indicators are all ones that were not reported in the 1920 school year for some reason or another. Uh, the top four were all, uh, the, the top four listed there, uh, not the, the most important four, but the, the four listed there um, are all assessments that didn't take place. Uh, school offerings for flexible pathways. This is looking at the specific number of flexible pathways that a school makes available to students. Um, we made the decision or the agency made the decision not to report that out um, because um, a lot of those flexible pathways were not, um, were not offered. For example, um, I use an example that's, that's close to my own experience. Uh, I have a, a child right now at Burlington High School. Uh, last year, they, they have a, a year-end studies program, which is a kind of an in innovative project uh, program at the end of the year where students really get some uh, some real control over their education. And those didn't happen last year. So that would have counted as a flexible pathway, but it's something that didn't happen in that particular year because you know everything went remote. Uh, disciplinary exclusion is another one that we chose not to. We actually did have, uh, I understand, I don't do this collection, but um, we did have data for disciplinary exclusion, uh, but it would really be an apples to oranges comparison because most disciplinary exclusions happen in the springtime when students are just getting tired of school and that's when we start to see an uptick of behavior. And last year when everyone went remote in March, there were no disciplinary exclusions or, or very, very few. So that, you know, any reporting out would just, it would be um, effectively meaningless in terms of, um, of, of, 
you know, rates uh, compared to other years. And then finally, there's one that's not included in um, in what was released last Monday, uh, and that just has to be it. That's just a timing issue. There's a per pupil spending indicator on there that's required under the federal ESSA uh, law, um, and that just gets reported out in June, just as the time um, that we get that information in and then gets into the in, into the system. It's just on a little bit different reporting um, schedule. That doesn't mean, however, that there was nothing of value. Um, like I said, there are about 18 different uh, indicators, 17 different indicators that show up. And um, there, are, there were plenty of indicators that still were reported. And I think that, uh, that, there's, that they're still worth looking at. Uh, for example, one of them is on English language proficiency. This is the percentage of students who are demonstrating um, for competency proficiency, uh, the percentage of English learners who are demonstrating English proficiency. This assessment actually took place uh, before, uh, was completed before uh, everything went remote in, in, uh, in March of last year. So we do have data for that one. Um, and you can see from here that the performance was not as high as we would like. We don't have as um, the number of English learners demonstrating proficiency is lower than what we would like to see. And the change, suggests that um, the actual number of people, not only is it low, but it's lower than it was a year ago in the 1819 school year. So that's something that, you know, that's concerning and something that we would want to, uh, you know, to try to make sense of uh, going forward. Um, so um, that, you know, we're seeing some of our most vulnerable students um, are, not, are not succeeding at the, um, at the same level. Another example, um, this is not the number of schools who are offering flexible pathways, but the number of students or the percentage of students who are participating in flexible pathways. Now, you can see up here what I've done is we're looking just at students who um, are in one of those four what we call historically marginalized groups. Um, so we're at the, in this case, we've just we're not looking at any um, any students outside of that group. Um, but what we're seeing is that there is uh, continues to be a gap in the just in just simple participation in flexible pathways. So um, our historically marginalized students are not participating in flexible pathways at the same rate as our historically privileged as their historically privileged peers. So if I'm on an IEP, if I'm from an ethnic or racial minority, um, if I am free and reduced lunch, if I'm an English learner it appears that there's a lesser chance that I am engaging in a flexible pathway than someone who is not in uh, a member of one of those groups. Um, and so that gives us some, uh, some ideas that we need to figure out. Uh, and again, I'm looking, we're looking just at state data here. We could do the same, uh, every SU, uh, every school can look at the same data uh, to understand their local, uh, their local context as well. Uh, but at the state, it uh, suggests that we need to be um, helping schools understand ways that they might be able to uh, reach out more to those historically marginalized students uh, to participate in flexible pathways. A similar one, this is looking at uh, the percentage of students who have demonstrated proficiency on a college, in career, a college or career readiness assessment. And so this would be uh, a particular cut score on the SAT, ACT, uh, a passing score on um, uh, a passing score on an AP exam, uh, completing um, um, a dual enrollment course, um, earning through the CTE process an industry recognized credential. There are about six or seven different ones there, and again, it's a little hard to see here, but uh, looking just at his, our historically marginalized students. Right, we're seeing that their uh, their performance is uh, is low. That we have it's it's very hard to see on, on this screen, but that says thirty one percent. Only thirty one percent of students in the state um, are demonstrating proficiency on one of those indicators of college and career readiness, um, and that is substantially smaller than the percentage of students who are demonstrating uh, from the historically privileged group who are demonstrating proficiency on one of those college and career readiness uh, indicators. So, uh, you know, the, the data that we, that we do have from the 1920 school year shows that students who are, um, who are um, 
who are our most vulnerable students um, are struggling in a, in a few areas when compared to their, their more privileged peers. Um, I don't know if I'm, I've thrown a whole lot there, so I want to pause for a second to see if anyone has questions and would like to, me to go into anything in a little bit more detail. I think one of the things that, that I'm getting is it's not looking great. Is that something that is, is a fair assessment? <laughs> um, so it was certainly, certainly this follow, I mean, this isn't, I, I wish I could say it were a big surprise, but our students who come from um, uh, less advantaged backgrounds haven't done as well in school. And I mean, that's, that's, not, that's, not, a, that's not a Vermont issue. Uh, well, it is a Vermont issue. It's not a solely Vermont issue. It's an issue that we see repeated, you know, in, in basically every district in, this, in the state, in every district in the country, uh, in every state in the country, um, and, and nationally that, uh, that you know, your background has a profound influence on, uh, on your performance in schools. Thank you, Representative Austin. Oh, thank you. Um, when, when we met with VSAC this year, um, you know, we were wondering, I mean, I was wondering about, I asked about uh, what was getting in the way of some students either applying to college or getting into college or even the technical colleges. And again, it's anecdotal, but they said math, you know, that the students graduating, you know, were weak in math and the math skills and knowledge that they needed, you know, to go on to higher education. Again, that's an antidote. I don't know what the data is on that, but I'm just wondering, they see a lot of kids and I'm just wondering if you see that would that then translate to kind of a focus, more of a focus on uh, math instruction, um, either, you know, just uh, I'm curious how that, that would translate into action and, and um, getting that, getting the students the skills and knowledge they need. Yeah, so that's an interesting one. Um, so I'm gonna be, we don't have data for at the state level for math this year because there's no SPAC. So, but we do have from previous years, and um, I re I remember from looking at the 1819 uh, annual snapshot. One of the things that we saw is that math performance is at its highest, uh, and this is looking at a, a summative assessment. The SPAC. This is not looking at what happens day to day in the classroom, but math performance um, on the SBAC is at its highest. In uh, in third grade, and that it uh, it steadily uh, decreases from third to ninth grade, um, and that same pattern follows for every single student group. Whether it's um, uh, you know if we're looking at students who are uh, on free and reduced lunch, looking at students who are not eligible for free and reduced lunch, we see that same pattern. The one place where we've seen something a little bit different is is girls. Uh, girls uh, still have a decline, but uh, the, our, our girls are not having as steep of decline from third grade to ninth grade as every other group. I don't know why that is. I don't, I don't know why that is. It would, you know, it would be the job, it would be our, our thinking then to see, is there something that we're doing that is either alienating other groups of students or something that is particularly engaging or instruction or helpful uh, for, uh, for girls that is, uh, that is beating this trend. And, um, so that would be something that we would really want to be looking at, uh, to, you know, that we could look at as, as a signifier, um, for, for other schools, um, or, or for, you know, to, to drive. And, but then this is where it gets really complicated is that, um, is it a situation that there is, um, a, a challenge with the curriculum? Is there a situation where there's a challenge in uh, the way that the curriculum is being delivered? Is there a particular way that that curriculum is delivered that, you know, that, that alienates some and engages others? Um, and I, you know, uh, we, we really don't have uh, simple answers to those questions. Thank and, you. Um, yeah. Thank you. We can keep going. So, 
Yeah, so one other place that this is something that we don't see. Um, I, actually, I should, I should draw attention to this. Um, in the 1920, the, the, uh, the data that's just released last week, you'll see this blue bar at the top that shows up all throughout the annual snapshot that basically says, when you see these NAs, it's because we didn't, uh, we didn't collect that data due to COVID, just so people are, um, are, are aware of that. This is one um, particular indicator that we, that we have that we're really curious to be tracking over the course of the next couple of years. So right now, uh, this is looking at uh, educator retention. And uh, basically it looks, at, uh, it looks at superintendents, it looks at principals and it looks at teachers. And it's saying what percent of teachers um, have or what percent of teachers, what percent of principals, what percent of superintendents uh, have been at their positions and their current placements for at least three years? Um, and so, how much turnover are we seeing, or how much, uh, how 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 successful are we being in retaining teachers? And in general, this is something that's that's not a concern right now that we don't have uh, compared to uh, we have about the amount of natural uh, turnover that we might expect. However, this is a really really big concern locally, in the state, and nationally uh, in educator workforce because of COVID. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of thought that because of COVID, we might see really, really big turnover. So this particular indicator is going to be something that we really want to watch over the course of the next couple of years to see if we see a, a, a major decline in, um, in the number of, of teachers who are, um, uh, the number of teachers who are leaving the profession. You know, it's a concern. This has been a very, very hard year to be a teacher. And so there is some concern that we might see that um, start to take place. Did it also have anything to do with an aging uh, population? It, it certainly could. And, it, and it's also probably, specific, we're, we're not seeing, our, our hypothesis is, and we're working to gather some data on this, our hypothesis is that it's not um, the same issue in all parts of the state. Certain parts of the state are seeing more than others. Uh, and it's not the same issue for all endorsement areas. For example, we think um, that uh, we're seeing more turnover in special education than we are seeing elementary uh, elementary teaching. Um, and we're trying to, it, it's very, it, it sounds like it would be a pretty straightforward uh, data collection to get, but it's it's actually quite tricky to be able to say those things with, uh, with, with certainty. I think there's a question there, yeah. Representative James. Yeah, thank you. And um, could you explain just a little bit more about the properly licensed factor? Here? Sure. Uh, this is just looking at what percentage of teachers who are teaching in their um, uh, their, their teaching assignment, they are a fully licensed, either a level one or a level two teacher to teach that, as opposed to someone who is uh, teaching on a, an emergency or a provisional license. Um, or someone who is um, who is teaching outside of what their uh, their licensed area would be, uh, a middle school uh, social studies teacher who is picking up uh, a middle school English class because they don't have uh, uh, in, you know they don't have um, enough to be there. Uh, but really, what we're seeing with that is that's a pretty small problem in Vermont that we really have uh, a very high percentage of our teachers are properly licensed, uh, fully endorsed to, to teach in the subject areas that, they're, that they are um, endorsed to teach. Uh, yeah, I think there's another question there maybe. Yeah, um, excuse me. Do, do you have a correlation between the turnover and the LAA uh, pay scales? Do, do you see a significant significantly more turnover with the lower paying districts? So that's that's a really good question. It's not analysis that we've done. Uh, we can look at, like I mentioned, this um, we're looking at state level data right now, right now. Um, but we are um, we could look at that this this retention question at every single uh, uh, LEA, every single supervisory union or district um, to um, you know, to, to see what that, you know, what that correlation might be. Um, I can say this is anecdotally, and um, I, I, I feel comfortable saying this, although um, I'm, I always um, caution when I'm, I'm putting words in someone else's mouth. 
Um, I have heard from, uh, I do hear from certain superintendents uh, that they have a harder time retaining. It's, um, it's a combination of pay and location. So for example, um, uh, districts kind of in, in Franklin County um, have a tend to have a hard time retaining teachers because of their proximity to Burlington that they get a lot of teachers who will come for a few years the anecdotal information is they come for a few years uh, until then they can get hired in uh, you know someplace or they continue to live in Burlington it's clo or Chittenden I should say Chittenden County uh, it's close enough to be able to make that commute but are looking to work closer to home um, whether that's uh, a quality of life issue, whether that's pay issue would, would be, uh, a, you know, um, require further investigation. Um, but it's not a, it's not a question that we really, um, that we really investigated specifically. Yeah, I just remember in testimony, the uh, superintendent for Kingdom East, um, I believe the number he said, she said was 50% every year, which was, seemed a little bit excessive. Yeah, it, yes, it, it, it certainly, there's certainly, um, it's not something that we would expect to be consistent uh, across all um, LEAs, uh, whether it's pay or quality of life or, you know, whatever, th those get a little bit more difficult to see, but, you know, a, a correlation like that would be, uh, would be something that would be, you know, interesting to see to make a, to make sense of. I apologize, my dog saying hi. Um, I, I did want to just show uh, a little bit. Um, I, I, I know that you've had some um, um, some presentation or some testimony on recovery plans, but I just wanted to kind of show what uh, LEAs have been having to do in order to address the recovery plan, or in order to, um, to, to complete the recovery plans. Real quickly, um, LEAs are looking at their, their, uh, their needs along three different pillars, student engagement, um, uh, academic achievement, and mental health or social emotional learning. Uh, we are at the point where we've received uh, kind of their, their identified needs. And by the end of, uh, by the, end of the month, every uh, LEA will have uh, is to uh, submit their, their plans, which is very different than the actual recovery work, but just the, the plan for, uh, for getting that recovery work in. Uh, the challenge becomes, this is kind of going back to that, that very first graphic I've kind of tried to, to recreate, that we have standards over here. The standards haven't changed, um, but the data that we have um, to, to make sense of those standards has changed. We still have the annual snapshot, but it's not that they don't have, the LEAs don't have the, the same level of data to look at in their annual snapshot as they would in different years. So instead, they need to rely on their local comprehensive assessment systems, LCAS uh, for short, uh, to, you know, to really look at what, do their what are their local data saying, which is good practice anyway. They should be looking at the local data and they do look at their local data. So it's, it's good practice but they need to rely a bit more on their local data as opposed to these, these larger scale summative um, uh, 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 data sources. And then they also need to look at kind of daily stuff that happens in the classroom where teachers are making decisions um, you know, on a split second by uh, noticing or asking smart questions to students and then using that kind of the, that, that, those constant decisions to really understand trends that they're seeing across the school. And then instead of the continuous improvement plans this year, in most all cases, it's the recovery plan, which is being done, which is, which is really, a, 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 I don't wanna say a scaled down because it makes it sound like it's not rigorous. It, it remains rigorous, but it is a, a version of the continuous improvement plans focused specifically on recovery efforts uh, that are, um, that are going forward. So the, the logic remains the same um, as we saw in the beginning, but a little bit different here um, in terms of um, uh, what the actual product that a school needs to put out. And then the big is that schools are having to rely more on their local comprehensive assessments, their formative assessments uh, than they would in, in previous years, just because those other data sources are, are not available. Um, and um, you know, recovery plans. Uh, I, I I don't I don't want to go too far in this if this is not of interest to uh, to the committee. But 
you know, they're giving, uh, identifying needs on all three of those recovery pill pillars. As I mentioned, they're having to look for uh, diverse data sources. Um, it really is focusing on multiple years of work. Schools are not going to be back to quote unquote normal in uh, September. They may look a little bit more normal, but there's been a, a big uh, upset to the system. And it's going to take several years for schools to get to the point where they where they kind of back to where they were. Um, and then, uh, you know, there are a lot of different funding sources that are there, and there are others who are a lot smarter about the details of those funding sources uh, that exist, but certainly the ESSER sources are uh, big funding sources available to individual LEAs. And, um, and we're, so we're, we're seeing this from schools, we're having this conversation at the state too, that there's really, um, this is a kind of a generational uh, opportunity for schools to really be thinking deeply um, um, about what they want to look like you know, three to five years from now, um, because it, it's kind of unprecedented uh, levels of funding that's coming into individual schools um, through the ESSER, ESSER money. And um, a lot of schools are using that to, to really rethink uh, kind of previous assumptions or to enact ideas that, that they've uh, wanted to in the past, but just haven't had the funding to do so. Thank you. Other questions? We have about five more minutes. Representative Austin. Um, much to the discomfort of my committee, I could probably ask a hundred more questions and spend two days talking to you, uh, Mr. Sure. Halliday, because I love, I, I don't know the, the granular stuff of data, but I do like kind of evidence-based data. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at the SBAC, you know, kind of the snapshot here, and it looks like 50% point to third graders in the state on the 218 SBAC um, were proficient in reading. And we just are passed, or hopefully the governor will sign this li literacy um, bill that we just put, you know, that hopefully once it's passed, it will be a huge systems issue in terms of addressing reading specifically in Vermont. And I'm wondering, can you take this kind of as a benchmark or as a starting point and then look at it again and let's say, well, look at it every year, but just like say, we're gonna look at five years and just see this initiative you know, that was passed by the legislature, did it make a difference in increasing and improving? Is there a way to do that, to look at what we uh, pass and tying it to uh, outcomes? Uh, absolutely, you can look at multiple years of data. And um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna just real quickly, I know that we're, you're running close on time, but I just wanna, I'm gonna pull up the snapshot and just give you uh, a quick, idea of how you can do that. So it's great. Um, let me share my screen again. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. So I think you can see this. This is just the, the landing page for the snapshot that exists right here. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly, but we're looking just at Vermont data. I could put in, um, you know, Addison, and I could pull up Addison Central School, Addison, you know, all the different, anything with Addison in it is gonna show up and I can select that. But for, for our purposes, let's just look at statewide data. And so you can see this is looking at 1920 data um, up here at the top. Um, this, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but up at the top. So that's why we have all of these NAs. So um, I'm gonna look at um, a little more at academic proficiency for your question. And I'm gonna look specifically at English language arts and I can click and look at English language arts. Now we have all of these NAs from this year. And as I mentioned before, I can pick all sorts of different student groups to look at this. And it's probably really small for your eyes, but you know, like this is uh, based on race and, race and ethnicity. This is uh, economic status, uh, whether a student is eligible for an IEP. I could, I could sort it in this way. I could sort it by individual grade uh, levels. So if we but look at I, third grade, English language learn, you know, English yeah. uh, reading, you know, ELA or whatever. Yeah. That's, that's what I would be curious about. How do we measure that this, what we, you know, the, the bill that we just passed yeah. actually improved outcome? So what we can do is we can look then at multiple years 
of data and I'm, um, I, I, I can, I know it's always frustrating to watch other people kind of navigate a website like you're supposed to understand what they're doing. But I, I, what I've done is I've selected three years of data. And so now what I'm looking at is, you know, three, and, and, and I'm looking at all grades. Uh, now I'm going to look at third graders in the state. All right, um, and I'm not sure exactly. I'd have to dig to see why that, that's not showing up. But what we're looking at is, oh, I know why it's not showing up for, for, for this, but uh, let's just look at this box right here. And this is um, how are third graders doing all students, because I've picked the all student group here. Over the course of those three years, what sort of trend? And what it shows is that third graders in the 17-18 year are meeting kind of the expectations. In the 18-19 year, are are you know roughly meeting the are meeting are meeting our expectations. Um, and then you know, looking out five years from now, I could see what sort of trend is going to exist, or I could say I'm really interested uh, in looking just at our students. Who are, um, who are eligible for special education. So you probably can't see this. This says IEP up here. So I can look at multiple years of data um, to see what sort of trend in third graders for the, um, uh, who are eligible for special education, am I making a bump in it? Now, obviously in perpetuity, we're gonna have this big NA for the 1920 school year because we don't have data from the 1920 school year. Um, but we could certainly start from the 21, 2021 school year and look out, you know, you know, for the next five years or however long we want to, to see if we're actually, um, if we're actually, you know, kind of changing the performance of either all students or particular student groups that are of interest to us. And again, um, you can look at an individual school district. Now, once you get smaller and smaller groups of students, um, if I'm looking at third graders in South Burlington I'm who are eligible on an IEP, I probably can see that data. If I'm looking at a really small district, um, I, that data is going to be suppressed to the public just for the because of you know F uh, FERPA laws and um, the ability to kind of determine uh, individual student performance on that. So we do run into some suppression issues as we start to get to, to, to smaller grain sizes of that. Uh, and I should say one thing about the suppression. Um, that's the suppression is uh, to the public view. But if I'm in uh, a district that has a small end size, I'm the principal of that school. I can see that data, you know, regardless of whether it's, um, you know, uh, um, it's just the public can't see it. Yeah. So I'm looking at the SBAC results for the third grade in 2018, and it says it's 50. 0.2%. So is that meeting? Is that kind of why? Is that that's what I'm trying to figure out? What is yeah. fifty percent? That that seems like it's not meeting to me. So I'm, I'm gonna, we've only got about we're actually over time at the moment. Yeah. We have um, ledge council in for the next next bill. But um, Representative Austin, I think this would be a great thing for you. I'd like to have <laughs> have um, Patrick Halliday answer that question. But I think uh, I'd love to have you spend some time. Great, if thank you would, you. And, and let us know more about that. So if you could just respond to that one, Mr. Halliday, sure. that would be great. Happy, happy to come back uh, for as much time as you like. Um, one, one thing, and this is a little, and I'm going to be real brief on here because your question is a really good one, but it's a complicated answer. Um, this, we made the determination um, not to, res to use proficiency reporting on this. Um, and instead, it's just kind of showing where the scale is. The, the, the challenge with proficiency is that if a student is just above the proficient line and stays steady, um, or if I'm a school that has a lot of students above proficiency, and I'm just saying, are they proficient or not? I really don't know how well that school is doing at, um, uh, at addressing the needs of students. Um, whereas if I'm showing their actual scale scores, which are aligned with proficiency, but they're not exactly the same thing. If I'm showing the actual kind of like the hard number scores, um, I can track progress uh, a lot better um, for uh, how, how a school is doing. So imagine I have a school that has 0% uh, proficiency, and I'm going to simplify this. Every student is scoring on, I'm making up a scale, is scoring one on a one to 10 scale. 
proficiency is defined as a seven. Well, I could have every one of those students who scores a one increase to a six and I'm still showing 0% proficiency. I could also have a school that has 100% students at an eight for that made up scale. And five years later, 100% of those students are still at an eight. The school actually hasn't increased the performance of those students. School one looks like they're really, really good are really bad because a zero percent of the students at proficient in school two looks really good because they're a hundred percent of the proficient uh, of their students at proficiency whereas if you dig deeper and I, I know this is a simplistic example but whereas you dig deeper what you really find is school one is actually really moved the bar and school two has done very little to to increase so right, um, and i think if you're looking at the vermont education dashboard they are still reporting proficiencies there yeah thank you that helps me understand how to read this data sure I think this is a great project for you, Representative Austin. <laughs> yeah, and I'd be happy to collaborate with it however much you need. Yeah, that's it's helpful. Um, I want to thank you uh, for this. This is, is helpful as we um, continue to look at how our students are doing and how we how we calculate and how we use data is very, very helpful. Um, if, if I could just give one. Yeah. 10 second parting, we have uh, we had 250 uh, educators across the state uh, join yesterday for our second of nine um, professional learning opportunities that we've partnered with uh, WestEd um, just to look at how to get smarter about using data. And it was just really, uh, it was really fun to see or really uh, encouraging to see that many educators interested in the conversation. And um, it's gonna be going on for the entirety of the, the calendar year. Thank you so much. Um, and the, the, the number that have actually completed their assessment needs at this point, is it complete? I think there's still a couple uh, of, school, of districts that have not uh, submitted their needs assessment and they've asked for an extension because they're working specifically with WestEd on this data literacy to identify what data sources they want to use to, to, to really figure out what those needs are. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually might want to stop this one and start another one um, just because they're such completely different topics. So why don't we just take a, a two minute pause or two minute, we'll, we'll end here. We'll start another um, session and start looking at 426.